All right. Sorry about the uh, delay there, but we're really excited to welcome you to this Polar Connect event. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of technical challenges when we're talking um, across the globe. Uh, today, we are really excited to be with our Polar Trek teacher, Lisa Sheff, and the science team that is aboard the RV Sikulik. Uh, they are working um, in the Beaufort Sea, which they'll explain where that is, and they'll talk about their research project that deals with the upwelling and ecology in the Beaufort Sea. Today is September 14, 2017. Uh, for those of you that are new to um, these types of webinars, there's a little th few things that we want you to know about them before we get started. Um, as you can tell this morning, we have a lot of classrooms, and we're very excited that you're all able to join us. The only drawback with lots of people joining is that we can have a lot of feedback uh, when your microphones or your phones are unmuted. So for the duration of this event, we're going to ask you to try to keep your microphones muted um, until we're ready to talk at the end. And um, we'll explain how to ask questions as we go along. The presentation, um, you should be able to type questions or say hello in the public chat, and many of you have found that already. You'll be able to see the list of participants to the far left. And in the center of your screen should be the content or the pictures um, that we'll be sharing with you um, over the internet. For today's presentation, we are not going to have a webcam and it should have just disappeared for you all because of the limitations of bandwidth from the ship where um, uh, Ms. Seth is located. So with that, um, the uh, next thing we'd all like you to do is to let us know where you are all from. And you've already done that, some of you, um, by saying who you are, what school, the number of students, and um, what grade you're in. Um, that helps us identify who's joining us today, and we'll share that with the research team. The research team and Lisa, by the way, do not have uh, the internet. Um, they are not going to be seeing all of your questions and your hellos. So Judy and myself with Arcus will be relaying all of your questions and your comments to the team that has joined us by phone. Before we turn it over to Lisa, and um, I just want to give you a little background about why she's on a ship in the middle of the Arctic um, the reason is she's part of a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called Polar Trek, Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. And we've been hosting these type of experiences for teachers for over 10 years. And teachers like Lisa um, are working with scientists like Dr. Ashen on board the ship and in a variety of locations around the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and we're really excited to be offering this um, program to teachers and, um, and have it supported by uh, the nonprofit Arctic Research Consortium of the United States that Judy and I both work for. So I mentioned questions. Uh, during the presentation, we'd like you to post your questions in the chat box below. And at the end of the presentation, um, we will ask you to raise your hand, and we can call on you and activate your microphones, or we'll have you, again, keep uh, typing those questions in the chat box, and we'll relay them to Lisa and the team aboard the ship. OK. So uh, Lisa, you are now at your first slide, your title slide, and you can unmute your, your uh, ship's phone there and tell us uh, who's all there and introduce your team. And, and um, as you go along, give me a next slide. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Spring School. And welcome aboard the RV Sikuliak, uh, which is a ship that the research team is working off of as their platform to do their research while we're in the Beaufort Sea. Um, just for a second before we really get rolling, the captain stopped by and just wanted to say hello. Um, so this is Captain Forrest McMullen. Good morning and welcome aboard. There's um, 40 eager um, scientists and crew here all excited to ask questions. And we're up here in the Fort Sea at uh, 152 north latitude, 71 longitude. 
at about 75 miles from Vero. Good morning. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. All right, yes. Good morning, and I just wanted to let you know, Lisa, you're coming in pretty good. It will help if you talk a little bit slower and a little more directed towards the phone. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome aboard the Sekuliak, as Captain McMullen just said. And the first slide shows you a little bit of what ship life is like on board the RV Sekuliak. You can actually, in the upper left, number one, see the slide uh, from a drone photograph looking down at the ship. And that's Captain McMullen, who just spoke with you all. Slide number two is the way we all know what's going on on board the ship all the time. So when we watch television, we don't watch SpongeBob or Game of Thrones. We're actually watching what each other are doing on the ship when we're in another part of the ship, which is really awesome. Number three, you can see the beginning of our safety drill before we actually left Nome. And then everyone always wonders what food we're eating. So there's a shot in number four of our cafeteria or the gallop. And then number five, you'll notice healthy options of food with oranges in the back upper left-hand corner and then the overwhelming awesome cinnamon rolls that the, uh, we have marked and Kim and Annie delivering, not every morning, fortunately, um, but every once in a while we get a special treat. Otherwise, we have lots of fruit and, and eggs and a pretty healthy breakfast. But when you're out at sea, it's really helpful to have a, a yummy snack every once in a while. We've actually had pretty amazing weather most of the trip out here, but we were hoping for an upwelling event. Upwelling event, uh, you need some wind. And so in picture six, you can see we did get some wind and it rocked us around a little bit. Number seven is a typical cabin on the RV Sekuliak where we're sleeping. I'm actually in the bottom bunk, and my roommate, Celia, has the top bunk. And during the story part, I think my body was actually above my mattress for longer than it was on the mattress during that night. It was a, it was a bumpy ride. Um, but for the most part, it's been really smooth sailing. And then in Picture number eight, we have a shot of one of several drones on board the ship that we use from time to time. And then we still can't get away from regular chores. So that would be picture nine with the um, washer and dryer. And so that's your little mini tour of the ship. The next slide, if you could go to it, please. Yep, thank you. Great, that's awesome. So. Welcome and meet everyone that's uh, helping to make research possible on the ship. It's actually not everyone. We're, we didn't have room to fit all of the crew on board, and they've been pretty amazing. Um, but that's a mix of scientists. So for the next few slides, you'll see which uh, one of the researchers who's speaking to you will fill announce their name and the institution that they work for. And then they're going to tell you a little bit about their part of the project. So it's a big ship. We have a lot of researchers on board. and. It's mind-boggling how much is happening 24-7 on the ship. So we'll move um, at the bottom of that slide. You can actually just see a little snapshot where New York is on the east coast of the United States. And way across and up, you find the Arctic, which is above 66.5 degrees north. And to get here, we flew uh, to Anchorage and then to Nome. And then we took a ship to the Bering Strait through the Chukchi Sea and to the Beaufort Sea, which is where we still are now. And actually, the ship, when we're headed north, doesn't get great connection. So just for all of you and all of you at Spring School, they turned this giant ship away from north so that we could actually talk to you today. Next slide, please. And Dr. Ashton is going to take it from here. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Karen Ashton. I'm um, the chief scientist of this cruise, and I work at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. So my, my uh, scientist team and I are working on this project, and we, the reason we're doing this is because we had a central question. We wanted to know why beluga whales are often found in the shelf break in the Beaufort Sea. So the reason we we're curious about this is because if you look at the, the picture on this slide, you see the north coast of Alaska, and then you see dots in the ocean that show where people um, working from air airplanes 
saw different types of whales. Red dots are bowhead whales, which are similar to right whales, which are found on the East Coast. And some of you from New York may have heard of, of, of the right whales. And the yellow dots are the beluga whales. And you can see that all the bowhead whales are seen much closer to shore than the beluga whales. So we wanted to know why do these beluga whales hang out on the shelf break, where the water goes from very shallow or quite shallow to very deep. And we thought that it might be because they can find a lot of their prey there. The beluga whales eat uh, fish, like our, such as Arctic cod, which is a very um, prevalent fish in the Arctic Ocean. So next slide, please. So the, OK, I see you've got the next slide. So our central question is, why are the whales found, are the beluga whales found along the shelf break? And that we thought they're seen there because they can find their prey. The little the central, the middle uh, figure on the right-hand side shows the food chain that we're studying. We believe, or we know, that the plankton, including krill, which look like that little shrimp on the left, and copepods, which are on the right, and that copepod is a is a little bit smaller than a grain of rice. So these plankton are eaten by the Arctic cod, and the Arctic cod then are prey or are eaten by the beluga whales. And we wanted to know why the shelf rig was a really good place for there to be fish so that the whales could find them. So to do this, we set sail on the Sekuliak, and our plan was to work along these lines in the map on the bottom that run from offshore to shallower water to deeper water north of Alaska. And each of the dots on those on that map was where we were going where we were going to do a station, um, which is where we would sample. Next slide please. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Dr. Okenen, who's going to tell you uh, the physical oceanography behind why we think this might be a good place for the whales to find food. Dr. Okenen. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so my name is Steve Oaknett, and I'm uh, a physical oceanographer with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, my job on the ship is to um, kind of describe the weather of the ocean. Uh, and the weather of the ocean is defined in terms of the temperature of the water, the salinity water, and the current speed in the, of the water. And um, I provide, or I share, all my many colleagues here on the boat. Uh, we're trying to um, determine how wind changes the temperature, salinity, and currents of the ocean, and how those conditions influence the location and behavior of the uh, organisms we're studying, the zooplankton, the fish, and uh, the beluga whales. I'm going to now hand next slide, please. Well, in this slide, there are a couple of pictures. Uh, the one in the lower left-hand corner, number one, is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. That's an instrument that we use to measure currents beneath the ship. And in figures two and three, you see a CDD rosette hanging off of an arm. And at the very bottom of that cage is a, an instrument called the CTD, and that is uh, what we use to measure the temperature and salinity of the ocean as it that instrument is lowered uh, down to the ocean bottom. And next slide, please. I'm going to hand you off to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kate Lowry. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Lowry, and I'm a biological oceanographer and postdoctoral researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I'm on board the ship because I'm studying phytoplankton, which are microscopic organisms that are found all over the ocean in the sunlit upper waters. Um, phytoplankton photosynthesize, and they produce over half of the oxygen that we breathe. They take up carbon dioxide, and they form the base of ocean food webs. So all of life is possible in the ocean because phytoplankton are producing energy that can be used as food for zooplankton and eventually for the rest of the food web. Um, you can see some images, the four pictures of phytoplankton. Um, those are some examples of phytoplankton that I have imaged on this ship um, that we collected from the waters. And um, they're extremely small, so these images are about 100 times their actual size. Um, and most phytoplankton are smaller than a human hair. On the next slide. I have a question uh, for you. Question. 
we have a question for you um, that relates to what a couple of you um, are talking about, just for clarification. Um, a couple of people want to know, are you closer to Alaska or to the Arctic? And another student asked, how deep is the ocean where you're located? That might help uh, bring in some context of what you're talking about. Thank you. Sure. So, um, so we are close to Alaska, but we are also in the Arctic. So we are in the Arctic just north of Alaska. And the current water depth is um, 170 meters, so about 450 feet or so. Um, and we've been kind of going back and forth between really deep water, like 3,000 feet, and really shallow water, um, like 100 feet. Does that, Thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes. perfect. Um, so I am um, looking at phytoplankton across the shelf. Oh, on the next slide. OK. Can, can you change the slide, please? Yes, we did. Oh, OK. Our, I think our connection is slow. So, um, but the question about depth is a great segue, because one of the things I'm looking at is how phytoplankton community composition, so type of phytoplankton changes as we go from deep waters to shallow waters, and then also how the type of phytoplankton changes in response to upwelling. And so my hypothesis is that upwelling brings nutrients to support um, different kinds of phytoplankton, especially bigger phytoplankton that are a better food source. And so in pictures one through four, you can see some of the tools I use, which is collecting water from the CTD uh, rosette, and then filtering and using GlowCam to look at um, images of phytoplankton. And next, I'll turn you over to the next scientist. OK. Uh, hello, my name is my name is Phil Alitalo. I'm with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, and on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and our team studies uh, zooplankton, which is the food for the uh, fish and the whales and other and birds and other zooplankton. They eat the phytoplankton that Kate just talked to you about, and uh, we're interested in uh, what types of phytoplankton, uh, what types of zooplankton come up from the upwelling. Now, maybe 13 years ago, we were up here in Alaska studying a similar project with whales and whale food. And we were looking for krill, which live in the deep ocean. We couldn't find them. And all of a sudden, we found them all washed up on a shore on the beach. So these deep water organisms were suddenly on the beach. How did they get there? Well, we figured it out. It's because of upwelling. So the deep water is moved up to take the place of the shallow water when the winds are at the, blowing in the right, uh, right direction. And we're testing different types of, uh, next slide, please. We're, just, we're, we're testing uh, our hypothesis using these tools. These are old things, old instruments. They're called nets, plankton nets. We have a couple different ones of them, kinds of them. And we gather specimens. We preserve some so that we can count them and identify them. And then some of them we, uh, for looking at uh, isotope analysis and, uh, and, and genetics as well. And so now I'm going to turn you over to one of the fish people. Hi, everybody. My name is Joel Yopi. I'm the one in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, I'm the lead for the fish team. And I'm at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And what we, as the fish team, are interested in are is how are these little fish that you see in the bottom right, they're called Arctic cod, how well are they eating? And how is that influenced by the upwelling and all the zooplankton available to them? So these Arctic cod are important prey for beluga whales. And if the Arctic cod are feeding well and doing well and growing well and are, are nice and fat and rich, uh, the belugas are nice and happy. They get a lot of, a lot of calories out of, out of each little Arctic cod. And we think that the upwelling can have an influence on the zooplankton, which has an influence on the Arctic cod feeding. And 
as you can see up there, we're, we're a team of five. And what we do on the next slide, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, a big net that we tow behind the ship. And we catch our cod in that big net. That's called a trawl net. And then we also look at the zooplankton in numbers two and three there. And that's the food that's available to this Arctic cod. When we catch the cod, we bring them on board. In number four, you can see us dissecting the little cod and looking in their stomachs and pulling out their organs. We're going to weigh their livers to see how fat and happy they are. And then finally, in that last picture, you see a tiny little white speck. And that is called an, an ear stone or an otolith. And that is sitting inside the head of the cod. And just like a tree, you can count rings on those ear stones and determine how old the cod are, as well as how fast they're growing. So there's a lot of things we can do with, with the cod, which are, again, important food for the beluga whales. All right, I'll turn it over to the next group, and we'll go to the next slide. Morning, everybody. This is Tamara Zeller, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And my primary job is to study seabirds on the ocean. So I sit on top of the bridge and look out the window and try to count what's out there. Um, seabirds are some of the top predators of the ocean food web, along with marine mammals. And they're feeding on all the critters that other folks have talked about, both uh, zooplankton and um, fish. So I want to know how many, what kind of seabirds are out there, what we're seeing, and how that's related to what the other folks are seeing as far as food, and if the seabirds can get get um, if it's available to them. So my job, if you can see the little diagram in the right hand corner, is like I said, I stand on the bridge and I look out the window with binoculars. I'm looking for any seabirds that show up on the surface. I count them and I enter them into a computer program that linked to GPS. And that data is used to make maps. And that's what the very last picture will show you, a distribution map. Um, this happens to be of albatross, but it, it gives you a good visual look at at presence and absence of different types of birds. So I'm going to hand it off to my next colleague. Hi, my name is Jenny Stern, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington. And I work with Dr. Kate Stafford, who is the lead marine mammal observer and researcher on this cruise. And we are up on the bridge, which is the top of the ship, looking for beluga whales. And beluga whales are. Um, like Dr. Ashton mentioned earlier, they're one of the two Arctic whales in this region. And they're different from bowhead whales because they have teeth. And uh, like some of the other scientists have mentioned earlier, they are eating fish as their prey. Um, also on this cruise, we are recording the sounds that beluga whales make using a hydrophone, which is attached um, to a mooring, which sits in the ocean. and. Uh, records the noises of the whales as they go by. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, we think that belugas are going to occur more likely on the shelf break, and uh, their presence is influenced by the wind speed action. And so think of beluga whales like a wind sock, as you can see in these two pictures. Um, and so. Uh, our question about beluga whales comes back full circle um, to the first slide that Dr. Ashton talked about. We'd like to know how the speed and direction of the wind change and physical structure um, of the ecosystem affects these whales. And uh, we're hoping to see them on the ship to confirm their presence. And so I will pass it on um, to the community observer. Good morning, everybody. My name is Britt Mercolius, and I work for UMIAC Environmental. So we're in the Arctic Ocean in the Beaufort Sea. And traditionally, this area has been hunted or whaled by Alaska Eskimos. So my job here is to help facilitate communications between research and the scientists and the Alaska Eskimo whalers. And right now, at a sensitive time, uh, the communities of Nuiqsut and Kaktovik have completed their fall whaling. And Yukavik is up next. And in addition to that, I also 
them up on the bridge surveying and uh, observing marine life. Thank you. And the next slide, this is Lisa Seth jumping back in. And this brings us full circle. You'll see on the left was the original plan of where the ship would go to collect data and that Dr. Karen Ashton started you out with. And on the right is where the ship actually went and what we actually covered as far as distance with the ship. And then if you look below, there's some numbers there. And that was from, I think, about two days ago in the morning for what we've done so far. And we're not quite finished yet. But we deployed four moorings, uh, eight. Uh, deployed the Acrobat Profiler, which is sort of, I think it is like a flying robot that goes beneath the sea and collects data. Then we have the CTD, uh, which we did the most of. That was 165 times that the CTD went down. And um, bongo net tucker trawls, midwater net trawls, and we did, we've done them actually quite a lot more since we made up this slide. Um, and if you look up at the diagram on the right, where it's what we did, and if you look to the right of the diagram, you can see transect number seven. If you go over to transect number six, you'll notice there's some red zigzags there. And transect six is where we were sampling when we had the stormy weather. So the ship couldn't go in a straight line. It actually tacked back and forth to make um, it more comfortable down below and make it safer for everyone while we were using the equipment. Um, and so I think. Uh, the last slide I'm just going to jump into, and just Jenny's just going to tell you this is actually um, not part of this research trip, but in case there are any polar bear questions out there, Jenny's a graduate student uh, who just spoke to you about the beluga whales, but she's also doing a polar bear project. So she'll speak to you uh, just for a few seconds. Hi again. Um, the I study what polar bears eat and how where polar bears live affect what kind of food they eat. And so I do this by looking at samples of their hair and their fat, which is in the bottom left corner. And using chemistry, we can look at these and see what the polar bears have eaten for the past month or the past year. So it's like if we snip a little bit of your hair off, we can see what you ate for the past year. And so I do that with polar bears. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. So that is the end of our slideshow. And I think um, we're really excited to hear what questions you all have. So Janet, if you want to sort of take it over since we can't see or really hear much. Yeah, great um, presentation. And there was a lot of questions that came up. Um, I'm going to have you mute your phone while I talk. Okay. Yeah, sorry. We just get a lot of b feedback when I talk and then um, <laughs> and your mic is open on the ship phone. So yes, lot, uh, great presentation and we did have a lot of questions. It will take a little while for us to go through them. So um, I'm hoping that all the scientists that um, presented are standing by because I didn't interrupt as they were presenting. Um, and so we will try to also find the slide that relates to uh, the question. So there is no order to this, Lisa and uh, team. It's going to be just uh, all the questions that came through. Um, starting with um, Ashley's question, she wants, or sorry, Lucia's question. She wants to know how many drones do you have? And uh, I think that's it for that question. So go ahead and unmute. And how many drones do you have? OK, great question. We have two drones on board the Sikuli. And um, they were used not for any specific research purpose on this time. Um, what they actually were used for were to get, try to get footage of the research that was going on, especially on the back deck. So, yeah, the drones, they were pretty awesome. Great motion. Um, OK. Yeah, uh, you were very hard to hear that time. Um, during the presentation, we heard everybody really well. 
Hi, sorry about that. I was on the speakerphone but holding the phone next to my ear, so that probably didn't come across very well. Um, so I'll just say it again. We do have two drones on board the ship. They weren't used for any specific research, but they were used to document some of the work that was going on board the ship. Okay, and if you just stay there doing that and relay to uh, the rest of the team, that might work and pass because uh, when you do whatever you're doing right now, I don't get a whole lot of feedback. Um, Ray would like to know how much of the sea becomes sea ice? Seasonally, the entire Arctic Ocean still does uh, become completely frozen in the winter. And then you get a certain percentage of that melting in the summer months. Um, and there's been a general pattern of more sea ice melting in the summer months than there has been historically in the past. Okay. Uh, T. Frazier would like to know if the ship stores water to be able to do laundry and do you have enough for showers and drinking. Hi. Fortunately, this ship has a desalinator, which means that they can actually make pretty much as fresh, much fresh water as we need. And we hold, the captain just yelled out, we hold 10,000 gallons of water on this ship. So for 40 some odd people, that's enough to keep us regularly bathed and washing our clothes with a pretty good schedule. Um, when it gets rough, though, they do shut down the washer and the dryer because, as you can imagine, if you add ship tossing back and forth, uh, might wash the clothes a little too much when they're in that washing machine. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> it's its own washing uh, cycle. Uh, Ash, Ariel is curious, how long exactly have you been traveling? So we've, we've been, we left the dock in Nome with the ship on the 25th of August. Sort of, you lose track of time out here a little bit, but we did leave up on the 25th of August. So we've been at sea for about 19 days, and we will be returning either late on the 17th of September or the 18th of September. So we've been out here, it'll be total for about three and a half weeks. Okay. Um, another student was asking about the drones, which you already responded to how many, but they wanted to also know how many do you actually use in experiments? Do you use all of them? And maybe elaborate on that. On this trip, we're actually not using the drones for any experiments. They were just brought along as uh, to document. There you go. Okay, uh, a student from your school would like to know, do you have any animals on the ship? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. We actually found a stowaway on board the other day, and it landed on the top of Dr. Ashen's head before it went flying past me and uh, into the hallway, and we found it eventually very happy in the electric room. Uh, and um, so so that's sort of, I guess, as close as we get to a pet. Otherwise, we have a lot of organisms on board that are part of the research. We have phytoplankton, and we have the zooplankton, the krill and the copepods, and we have the arctic cod. So some of those things that we sample, searchers actually keep, because they can't do all of the testing um, on board the ship. So they'll either send it out or they'll do more with those organisms when we get back to land. Uh, Mr. Scala and Ms. Yardley uh, from FIVE would like to let you know, we love these research questions. The team is doing some amazing inquiry work. Um, good, nice compliment. Uh, from Ray, is the concentration of phytoplankton higher in the Arctic?
So that's a really good question. Um, and uh, this is Kate again, Kate, Kate Lowry at, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So in general, there are higher phyto concentrations of phytoplankton in polar regions. So in some parts of the Arctic and the Antarctic, where we are right now, there's actually not a lot of phytoplankton. And I think that may be in part due to the fact that zooplankton are eating them. <laughs> Okay. Um, let's see. Can Miss uh, Fraser? Can you see icebergs or glaciers? During our first conference before we came up here, you can actually go to a chart, and I will put this in a journal tomorrow, or I guess that's today, later today. Um, that will show you where the sea ice is, and I will make a star for where the ship is. So um, fortunately, we don't have to go through any ice, because that would add um, additional stress for some of the tests that we're doing. Um, and But unfortunately, I think everybody would love to see the ice or have an iceberg floating by. So unfortunately, it's, the winds have, have that sea ice in the summer, especially it shifts with the currents and the winds. Um, and right now, it is not anywhere near us. Great question, though. OK. Um, back to phytoplankton. Uh, Anne wants to know, is the lowest depth where phytoplankton can live affected by water temperature and salinity? And do these affect how far down sunlight is found? Hi, this is Kate again. Um, so that's a really good question about phytoplankton. And the major factor that determines what depths they live in is sunlight. So if the waters are really clear, then you can get light down to, for example, 200 feet or, or, or so. And then you can have phytoplankton living that far down. Um, but often, phytoplankton are kind of in the sunlit um, surface waters. And they can tolerate a range of temperature and salinity in the ocean. Um, so here, even when it's extremely cold near freezing water, they can still um, survive as long as they have enough sunlight and enough nutrients. And uh, while you're there, a question that came up that's related is, what is the average temperature of the water and salinity level? So that's a great question. Um, currently, right now, the water that we're in, the salinity is 29.37 PSU, and which is which is a little fresh. It's not too salty, but well, it's still really salty. But it's not the saltiest waters we could see. And the temperature is four degrees, 4.4 degrees Celsius. Which can someone help me out with Fahrenheit? Four degrees. Four, you know, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit water. So um, it's it still seems cold, but it's actually pretty warm for the Arctic. OK. Uh, Ian would like to know, have you spotted any Greenland sharks? No, we have not seen any Greenland sharks. They actually like to stay like, pretty deep. And I'm not even sure, are they even in this in the Beaufort? We're getting, we don't think that they're actually this far over here. So um, so no, we have not seen any Greenland sharks. But um, And they actually, I think, just eat little things um, anyway. So we don't have to worry about them if they were here. But they're not in this region that we know of. Um, OK. And um, there was a follow-up question by Anne um, to the phytoplankton one. What determines how deep sunlight will reach? So that's a really good question and something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So one of the biggest factors is actually sea ice. So if there's sea ice covering the water, then there's not a lot of light getting to the phytoplankton. Um, so that's especially important earlier in the season when there's more sea ice present. Um, but otherwise, what, can, um, what determines it is just really how clear the water is. So if there's a lot of, uh, of organic material in the water, like either terrestrial gland sources of, um, of runoff or things that have 
um, that have tannins that absorb sunlight, then there's not a lot of light. Or if there's a lot of phytoplankton, then there's not a lot of light. So um, in really clear blue waters, you can have phytoplankton um, really deep. Uh, if it's really green waters, then often the phytoplankton are just at the surface. OK. All right. Great. Yeah. And I just was speaking with Dr. Go ahead. Janet? Um, I was just speaking with Dr. Ashton, and we were just talking that the minimum sea ice um, typically occurs somewhere in the last couple of weeks of September. So once you get into October, that's when the the sort of the later fall and winter ice starts accumulating again. OK. Um, I have a couple of questions about the fish. So how many fish do you need to catch each day? And did you eat any of the fish that you catch? So that, that's also a very good question. Uh, to answer, uh, yeah, that's pretty much this. I'm sorry, we can't, we actually can't hear you. You're breaking up. Oh, I was not on speaker. That was Lisa's fault. <laughs> uh, so that's a good question about uh, how many fish do we need. And if we're interested in, in how many fish are out here, uh, we tow our net, and, and, and we're interested in how many total there are. Uh, there are some analyses that we're doing. We're looking at how well they're feeding. And we, we really only need, say, 50 to 100 fish per location where we sample. And we're sampling at several locations to get at uh, some spatial differences, uh, especially with regards to the upwelling. So if you have upwelling in one region or at one time, we only need a few trawls and a few fish to show that there's an effect. Um, okay. There's another question, I believe. Yeah, there's actually a couple of fish questions. Oh. Next, how many do you eat? Uh, or do you I eat them? <laughs> the digital is actually quite small. Um, they're not your typical Atlantic cod that, that are big and, and the ones that people eat. I would guess that they taste very similar, but they're very small. Um, and we haven't, we actually, we actually have not eaten them on board. But, um, our chef said that he would be happy to cook them for us. <laughs> uh, uh, from a Mrs. Katz class, um, are you finding any pollutants like plastic in the cod's stomach? Uh, we're not finding any plastics yet in the cod stomach, but most of the stomachs that we're, we're taking, we're not actually looking in yet. So we're, we're cutting the stomach out, we're putting it in the freezer, and then we're going to take it back to the lab and dissect it under a microscope there. And, you know, maybe we will find some plastic then, but uh, the Arctic is so far pretty, uh, fairly pristine when it comes to pollution, I think, and so I don't expect to find much plastic. Uh, another fish comment is Harry in first grade wants to know if your job is dirty. He says the fish looks dirty. Dissecting fish is very dirty. Uh, luckily, we put we put uh, rain gear on and. Uh, we dive right in there, cut the fish open, and there are blood, blood and guts everywhere. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of the beast, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's not for the faint of heart, for sure, because of all the blood, but um, it's pretty cool. Okay, we have another and if first. You're from, oh. and, and just to follow up on that, if you're from the coastline, and I know my students back at spring school, um, a lot of you go fishing, and a lot of you probably already you know, fillet fish. So in a way, it's very similar to filleting fish. Um, but this is sort of over and over and over again. <laughs> um, but they do, they do seem to enjoy what they do. Very good. Um, 
So we have a uh, Lisa's first grade student wants to know if people go in the drop cage and um, I don't know exactly what picture that had to do with, but anyway, that's the question. So far, we haven't put anyone over the side of the ship, and I think that we're, that's not something that we do. And I'm, um, but you might have seen the CTD, which is the tool that actually helps collect water for phytoplankton, and that Dr. Okunen uses to test the physical environment of the ocean. What's really neat is the, that's in a special room called the Baltic Room, and the first I think one of the first couple of days we actually began testing, someone said, if you go in the Baltic room, you have to wear your life jacket and your hard hat, which is something you have to do whenever you're working on the aft area of the ship and they're using heavy equipment to move nets or other equipment. And I thought, well, that's weird. It's a room. Why would you have to wear a hard hat and a life jacket when you're going to be inside? But what is really cool, and you might have seen in that picture, Janet, I don't know if you can go back to one of our, uh, it's like our first, second, third fourth or sixth slide, maybe, um, Dr. Okunen's first one. It's actually his second slide. And it showed the wall open. And our next one, if you're on Steve's second slide, you'll be on the right one. Yep. So that may be what you saw, which it actually looks like. It could be a cage that would hold a person. But that holds oceanographic equipment. And so you can actually see where that entire wall in the Baltic room slid open. So once I saw that, I understood the safety purposes. This is heavy equipment. When they have to lift that huge CTD rosette, put it out of that doorway on the arm, and then that entire thing drops down on a cable of wire, wire and it's uh, with a winch. And someone's actually inside a room in the ship watching that whole operation and um, operating that to go deep in the water and collect what they need before it comes back up to the surface. And then they do shut the door when they're done. OK. Um, there are several um, people that typed in. Uh, they want to know what latitude and longitude you're at. Basically, they are trying to figure out where you are. So we are at north latitude, which, and the north means we're north of the equator. So 71 degrees north, 41.152 minutes. And um, then our longitude, sorry, I don't have my glasses on, is 152 degrees, 50.179 minutes west of the prime meridian. So we're in the northern hemisphere, and we're also in the western hemisphere because we're west of the prime meridian. Okay. Um, from Anne, what basic conditions spawn zooplankton? Does upwelling spur zooplankton to procreate, or does it merely change their position in the sea? Bill, uh, the upwelling, uh, what it does is it brings the deeper water up to the, uh, to, onto the shelf. And the deep water tends to have a lot of nutrients. So it actually stimulates the phytoplankton to grow a little, a little bit and provides more food for the zooplankton. But the zooplankton, uh, once they get fed a lot and they grow up to be adults, then they'll start to procreate. Uh, but that may happen months later. And just, just to go back to upwelling for a second, if you live along the coast, again, like at spring school, and but it really anywhere, and you get a storm where the wind is blowing onshore, and then maybe you go for a walk the next day, and you see a lot more seaweed washed up on the beach or a lot of shells washed up on the beach, upwelling is when the winds blow in a certain direction, and they're not well, sometimes they do actually blow them up onto the beach. If you remember Phil talking a long time ago, they found krill on the beach. And they're like, wow, these should live in the deep ocean. What are they doing on the beach? So when you see things wash up on the beach after a big storm, that same thing really happens in the ocean. But there's deep parts of the ocean and shallow parts of the ocean. 
So when the wind blows in the right direction, that's upwelling when it moves the water and the organisms with it up onto the shallower part of the ocean. And so that's what upwelling is. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, there are some people that are starting to sign off as we come up towards the top of the hour. And I just wanted to let uh, people know as they are signing off um, that if they didn't get their questions, and there were a lot of really great questions today, um, that they should post them to you. And also Lisa will, um, will share the questions that we uh, captured in this chat with you in an email so that the uh, team might be able to answer them as well. Um, so anyway, it looks like you guys also might be able to see the chat that's going on from the ship so you can see that some people um, have to leave. Um, we are also archiving this event, so if you are leaving out early, um, we'll be able to share that with you and it will be on the website as well. Um, we'll take a few more questions that came through before we wrap this up. Um, there was uh, some questions about uh, beluga whales. And uh, one of them was, how deep do they dive? And another question was, and I love this one from Jacob in first grade, um, do beluga whales eat people since they have teeth? Hi, it was a little hard the second part of that question, we heard that you want to know how deep they're going to dive, and Jenny's going to jump on in a second, but part of that question? The second part was, uh, do beluga whales eat people since they have teeth? <laughs> so uh, the deepest that we know belugas dive is about 800 meters, which is about half a mile. And beluga whales do not eat people. Um, instead, they are eating Arctic cod. And if you remember the Arctic cod, they get up to about 30 centimeters. And 30 centimeters is about a foot long, be about the largest size that you're going to get. And most of the ones that we're catching are smaller than that. OK. Um, we have uh, several questions about polar bears. Um, the first question is, how many polar bears have you seen? Uh, the next one, have you seen any starving polar bears? Hi. Um, so we have not seen any polar bears. In the oh, and it's not um, part of this research. And if we were to see polar bears, uh, they would be swimming, um, but we have not seen any this trip. And um, how you tell if a polar bear is starving, we actually rate them from one to five based off of uh, how round they look. And so a five is a really obese polar bear, and a one is a starving polar bear. But we haven't had to use that scale um, because we haven't seen any polar bears. We're a little too far offshore and far away from the ice. OK. And that brings up just a good point that the majority of this trip, we cannot even see shore. So we're, we're a good distance away from shore. OK. Um, I have two questions that I want to wrap up the rest of this webinar for. And thanks, uh, everybody, for joining. Um, I do want to relay before uh, they sign off that Mr. Scalen and Ms. Yardi say thank you for connecting with us and a huge shout out to one of our resident scientists. We look forward to you when you return. Ms. Uh, Shamel says thank you for sharing and teaching us. Look forward to seeing you soon, um, Lisa. Uh, our last two questions, these are good ones, so that's why I wanted to end with them. Um, uh, Gretel would like to know what are the consequences of climate change on the food web? Hi, this is Karen Ashton again. And, and you wanted to know what the consequences of climate change are on the food web. And actually, that is something that we're studying um, during this cruise, as well as all the other scientists who work up um, in the Arctic. And we don't quite know the answer to that. 
So that's why we're doing research. Excellent. And uh, the other question is um, from the uh, Mrs. Katz's AP Environmental Science class. How many fields of science um, are were used? Um, they were interested to research beluga whales, but I think it would be a good one for the whole ship. So how many uh, fields of science are used um, not only to research beluga whales, but are seen on this ship? Hi, that's a terrific question. Um, so there's about approximately six fields of science that are covered on this ship. And what I think is really interesting to understand is that you need to understand the physical environment and how that's structured to then look at how the living organisms um, act within that environment. And so when the physical environment changes, if the behaviors of the organism change, then you know there's a connection between the physical and the biological aspects. OK. Oh, oh yes. And uh, sorry, we missed one. And it's mathematics is definitely a huge part of it. But then you could go even further. Engineering is a part of it. It's, it's really pretty much any science and math and engineering that you can think of Computer science also, yeah, there's this, so I, I think you could probably, oh, communication, which is language arts, very important, That's because if researchers can't communicate what they're doing in spoken and written word, then no one's going to know, and they're not going to be able to talk with each other and, and put things together to understand it. And then we also have our community observer, and so one thing that researchers really recognize is that it's super important to connect with the community for the Eskimo population up here because they've been watching and understanding the natural environment for quite a long time. So they're definitely another big part of um, this, this research trip. OK. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing. And um, we wanted to. Um, let people know that, again, if you didn't get your question asked, and there were some fantastic questions that we'd like you to um, share them with Lisa online through her journals. Um, and again, we'll share the list of chat questions with Lisa so she can um, get them answered by the team as well. Um, this event will be archived and available online um, in a couple of days. And uh, we'll send it out to everybody that's registered. Um, and with that, we're going to stop the recording and 